Good evening, good evening. Can you hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. You're all louder than you think you are. <laughs> uh, my name is James Kenley. I have the honor of serving as the executive director of the Vail Symposium. And on behalf of our board and our staff and our wonderful volunteers, thank you for being here for a program entitled Nazi Billionaires, The Dark History of Germany's Wealthiest Dynasties with David de Jong. The Vail Symposium has been offering thought-provoking, affordable, and diverse programming to the Vail community since 1971. Quick show of hands who've been to a Vail Symposium program before. Oh, I love you guys so much. You'll be familiar with this next part. We are a nonprofit organization, and 90% of our operating revenue comes from donors and sponsors. And I'd like to thank a few of them now, including discovervale.com, that's the town of Vale, and the Frechette Family Foundation. Our event sponsors, Vale Resorts Epic Promise, the Vale Daily, and the Antlers at Vale. The summer season is generously underwritten by Cindy Engels, uh, and tonight's program was developed in partnership with our friends at Benet Vale. I'll get to the cell phones in just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to recognize all of our Lighthouse members who are here with us tonight, uh, who give a thousand or more annually. Thank you, we can't do it without you. Would you please put your hands together for all those good folks? <clears throat> Tonight's program has another collaborator. Jewish Colorado I brought David over from Europe for their summit series. He's on a Colorado tour, uh, and we're happy to welcome several of their staff here this evening. Uh, and I'd like to bring uh, Renee Rockford up to share a little bit about who they are and why they brought David to the U.S. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, everyone. What a fabulous crowd. We're so happy you're here, and we're delighted to partner with the Vail Symposium and B'nai Vail for tonight's presentation. You're in for a treat. We had David last night in Aspen and tomorrow night in Steamboat. So, <laughs> so I, I promise you, you will never get tired of the message. We are Jewish Colorado, your statewide Jewish federation. Um, we try to be um, border to border in Colorado. We work in Grand Junction, in Fort Collins, in Pueblo, Colorado Springs. And you may know us best for our safety and security work. I hope many of you have been trained here in this room by Phil Niedringhaus. He's our regional security advisor as part of our cooperation with the SCAN network in keeping particularly Jewish organizations safe um, all over the country. There's a card on your seat. It describes some of the other programs that we do statewide. We want to get to know you. We hope to be back next summer and even over the winter. And otherwise, um, welcome. And I'll turn it back to you, James. To frame our discussion tonight and to uh, introduce David DeYoung is friend of the Vail Symposium, Greg Dobbs, to my left. <laughs> they know you, Greg. In addition to his esteemed spot on our programming committee, Greg is a three-time Emmy award-winning journalist of over 50 years, including 25 with ABC News, uh, covering stories all around the world. You can find his insightful reporting on Substack, and I have to say, uh, I was setting up this venue with our staff today, and I got an email, and it was Greg posting about the Pergorsian story. He's always working, this guy. Don't do that while you're driving. <laughs> uh, we also highly recommend his book, Life in the Wrong Lane, why journalists go in when everyone else wants out. This summer alone, Greg has moderated programs for us uh, with Dr. Jonathan Ward on China and Bill Browder on Putin's Russia. And now, please join me in welcoming him back to the Vail Symposium stage. Thank you, and James, thank you. But the, the piece about 50 years was a lie. Total lie. <laughs> James mentioned an upcoming program, uh, Continuum of Reality. Tonight's going to be a concentration of reality. David DeYoung is a journalist. He lives in Tel Aviv. 
And for Bloomberg News, for the Wall Street Journal, for uh, Dutch Financial Daily, he's been covering finance and geopolitics. But he's not a journalist who does news stories that are here today and gone tomorrow. He digs deep. And for his book, Nazi Billionaires, The Dark History of Germany's Wealthiest Dynasties, he dug clear to the bottom of the pit. Because that's where these billionaires made their fortunes. They seized Jewish property. They pulled prisoners from the pits of concentration camps to work as slave laborers. Abetting, as I read one reviewer put it, the atrocities of the Third Reich. And today, some of their relatives are still living high on that bounty. Now, it's not fun to write about things like that. <laughs> Actually, David told me the funnest job he's ever had was, because he's a native of the Netherlands, as a bicycle courier negotiating with about half a million other bikes on the streets of Amsterdam. But then he went to college at Columbia University in New York and got a job with Bloomberg News, writing about finance. And he started looking into the family-owned, non-stock exchange fortunes. And from that came this book. Because as he peeled back the layers, as he peeled back the layers, he saw where the money came from. As he peeled back the layers, he realized, as he told me on the phone just the other day, these companies and families celebrated their father's and grandfather's good works, but left out their war crimes and their Nazi connections. And we're talking about families and companies that are household names. David spent four years in Berlin researching and writing the book, and he produced a masterpiece. It is, in some ways, the stuff of Nazi-themed movies, except for two things, two differences. Every story is true, and many of those who made their money from the Third Reich still have not been held accountable. So we're going to talk now with David DeYoung. Thank you, Jeff. And David, it's a little strange, but let's start in the middle, not at the beginning sure. of the story, not at the end of the story, but so that everybody knows who we're talking about. I made reference to businesses that are household names. Uh, these are businesses that are patronized and respected across the world. Mm -hmm. So give us an idea what the major players are. So it's the, um, the main family, the red thread of the book is a dynasty called the Quant Dynasty which today controls, uh, two of their heirs control the BMW group, um, uh, which doesn't only include BMW, but also Mini and Rolls-Royce. Um, and uh, their father, or their grandfather, and their father, uh, Gunther and Herbert Quandt, um, were some of the uh, you know, exploited, uh, almost 60,000 forced and slave laborers across their weapons and um, battery companies uh, in Nazi Germany, they uh, procured, they, um, procured uh, Jewish businesses uh, and, and owned by Jewish business families on the cheap in um, Nazi Germany uh, and also expropriated many other business owners in German-occupied territories across Europe. And thirdly, they were some of the largest arms producers of the Third Reich. Secondly, there is the Flick dynasty, which are the former controlling shareholders of Daimler-Benz. Uh, the patriarch, Friedrich Flick, is actually the only one of my main characters who was sentenced um, for war crimes and crimes against humanity at uh, the Nuremberg War Tribunal. Um, he ran a um, privately owned uh, steel, coal and weapons conglomerate um, and uh, had 120,000 um, people working for him, including more than 60,000 uh, people he exploited, also forced and slave laborers, including many concentration camp captives. He was the largest procurer of, of so-called Aryanizations, which was the which is a very perversely cynic term, which denotes the removal of, of any aspect of Jewish ownership from an asset, whether that is company shares or real estate or land or jewelry or art. Um, and he was also one of the largest weapons producers. And he, once he was released, uh, once, actually once 
the U.S. Um, High Commissioner um, for Occupied Germany, John J. McCloy, commuted his sentence in 1950. Um, within a decade, he was back on top as Germany's wealthiest man, uh, as the controlling shareholder of Daimler-Benz. And when he died in 1972, he actually died as one of the world's wealthiest men, alongside John Paul Getty and the likes, and without ever having to pay a pay, without ever having paid a penny to um, to any kind of restitution or compensation funds. Um, of uh, surviving forced and slave uh, laborers uh, that were exploited in his businesses. Thirdly, there is the von Fink dynasty, uh, which is the uh, dynasty that co-founded Allianz and Munich Re, uh, some of the largest uh, insurers and reinsurers today. Uh, they also owned a private bank called Merck Fink. And the patriarch August von Fink Sr. was a, uh, actually one of the few ideologues in my book, and he idealized Hitler, and he actually was tasked, because he was known as Bavaria's, wealth, Bavaria's wealthiest man, but also its stingiest man, the Nazi party tasked him with fundraising among his fellow industrialists and, and financiers to, for the um, Haus der Deutsche Kunst, which to, still today is a landmark in, in, in Munich. Um, it's now called uh, the Haus of Art, or the Haus, the Haus der Kunst. Um, it's on the southern border of the English Garden in Munich, um, and he fundraised between 1933 and 1937 uh, about 20 million Reichsmark, of which the building was built. Um, and as a thank you, he got to Aryanize uh, the Rothschild Bank in Vienna and the uh, Dreyfus Bank in, in Berlin. And he, uh, like uh, Gunter Quandt and Herbert Quandt, also went scot free after the war. Fourthly, there is the um, Porsche Pierre dynasty, which uh, the heirs today control uh, Porsche, which they separately listed uh, last year for about 70 billion uh, on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, but they also control Volkswagen, Audi, um, Bentley, Lamborghini, Seat, Skoda, and a whole range of other car brands. And of course, their patriarchs, Ferdinand Porsche, was uh, the um, was the man who uh, was the man who introduced the folks so the idea of the Volkswagen to Hitler and was known as Hitler's favorite engineer um, and his son-in-law Anton Pierre um, uh, their heirs today control the, um, the the Volkswagen group and Porsche but they had a third co-founder a man named Adolf Rosenberger who was a Jewish man who they pushed out of the company in, in 1935 and subsequently um, erase from, from, com from, from Porsche's um, company history. Fifthly, uh, there is the Utker dynasty, which may not be as well known. In America, uh, they produce, they uh, control um, uh, Germany's largest beer brewer, they control a whole a range of luxury hotels, including um, Cap du Ene Rock in, on the Côte d'Azur in Cap Ferrat, the Lanesboro in London, um, Plaza Athene in Paris, uh, but they also, but they're mostly known for um, frozen pizzas and, and uh, um, baking, pudding mixes and baked mixes. Um, and their patriarch, Rudolf August Utker, was also an ideologue who was actually trained, who was voluntarily joined the Waffen SS and was actually trained at Dachau concentration camp uh, in uh, 1944. Um, and in West Germany. Um, kind of rose to be one of the West Germany's uh, and then reunified Germany's most powerful industrialists and, and, and businessmen. So those are the five dynasties um, that are, uh, that form the main core of the book. The reasons I chose these five were, um, well, first of all, a little backstory how I got there was uh, when I was working as a reporter at Bloomberg News, I was actually hired as uh, on this new investigative team in, in late November 2011 to cover family-owned companies and family offices. And um, I was actually hired as a North America reporter. Um, but because I'm native Dutch, my American bosses soon asked me, oh, this Dutch guy, can't you, you know, I'm sure he speaks fluent German, can't you also cover kind of the family-owned companies in Germany uh, and in Switzerland and Austria for us? So I would spend a month a year between Thanksgiving and Christmas um, hopping around the Bloomberg bureaus in, in German-speaking Europe. And the stories I always came back with were this mix of the financial and the historical and the business side of things. And what struck me in my reporting 
was that uh, companies like BMW and Porsche, but particularly the families that control them, um, would celebrate their fathers and grandfathers, their business patriarchs, uh, for their business successes, but leave out on, on the on the websites or of global business of global charitable foundations, of museums, of uh, academic chairs, of corporate headquarters, um, and on media prizes even, but leave no trace of their um, or didn't mention anywhere any of their. Uh, war crimes or Nazi affiliations, after having prepared to have reckoned uh, with these crimes publicly. Um, so I found this such a uh, distortion of history, such a revision, it's a, such a brazen revisionism, that I decided to shine a light uh, uh, on it. And uh, I went on book leave for Bloom, from Bloomberg in 2017 and, and moved to Berlin and kind of never, never ended up spending four years on the, on the research and writing uh, from Berlin and uh, kind of never looking back, um, or at least not returning to Bloomberg, then we ended up moving to Tel Aviv. But the three, kind of the, why I chose these five families, um, the three kind of contemporary criteria were that they still had to be some of the most kind of powerful, uh, on a global level, they still need to be powerful in business. Uh, economically, financially powerful, either massive family offices that invest in private equity, um, funds of funds, or art, real estate, you name it, or still have con consumer-facing, or be active shareholders in con con consumer-facing brands. Because a lot of people ask me, oh, why didn't you include the Thyssen or the Krupp family, for example? It's because these dynasties have died out and those businesses are no longer in control of, of, of these families. Secondly, it had to be dynasties that that continue on, that have not died out, like uh, Thyssen or Krupp. Uh, thirdly, it, uh, I focus on those uh, families that have two to a dozen shareholders, so they have kind of effective economic control of their businesses, and they have an actual say of, uh, in their business, as opposed to shareholder groups of 200, 300, 400 family, uh, shareholders, uh, like with Siemens or with Henkel, uh, where they don't really have that, where it's very dispersed, so they don't really have any say in the business uh, uh, that much anymore. And then the three uh, historical uh, criteria were that they had to mass profiteer of the Third Reich through, as I mentioned earlier, the mass producing of armaments, the um, uh, expropriation of, of, of Jewish owned businesses and assets and expropriations in, in German controlled uh, or German occupied territories in Europe. And thirdly, the mass exploitation of forced and slave laborers across Europe. David, you, you mentioned one who was truly an ideologue and aligned with Hitler's idea of the uh, supremacy of the uh, Aryan race. But were the others, by and large, opportunistically exploiting the war to build their fortunes, to establish their plants on the backs of slave laborers? Absolutely. I mean, it, it started much earlier, right? It started from 1933 onwards, where Hitler, as the, um, having just seized power, promises these men explicitly, of course, on the back tail of the, of, the, uh, of the Great Depression, is that he is going to um, rearm uh, Nazi Germany and that they have, um, you know, and he, he delivers on that promise because by the, by the end of 1934, there's billions of Reichsmarkers flowing into the coffers of um, of the industrialists and, 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 and their companies for, for rearmament, which in itself wasn't criminal. It was in breach of the, Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, and that's why did, they did it secretly until 1935 when Hitler went public uh, with, uh, with the rearmament of, of, of Germany. But it quickly devolves into criminal behavior uh, following the implementation of the uh, Nuremberg Race Laws in September 1935, where initially these uh, Aryanization, these, uh, these transactions of Aryanized businesses had the veneer of, of legal transactions because they um, uh, you know, either Jewish business families in, 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 in Germany were coerced by the authorities or um, by their competitors to, um, aided by the authorities to sell their businesses at a fire sale price or they wanted to sell their businesses because they wanted to raise money to, to, leave, uh, to leave the country as, as, as soon as possible. But as persecution ramps up um, uh, in, 
over the latter half of the 1930s, this devolves into outright theft and, and, and robbery. Um, and these men, I mean, most of the families I write about, with the exception of the Porsche Pierre clan, which really laid the foundation of its wealth during the Third Reich, these families were already, when, when, when Hitler seized power in, in, in um, January 30 of 1933, already Germany's wealthiest business dynasties. I mean, they had uh, come up during the German Empire, they had, you know, succeeded to, uh, through the Weimar Republic, you know, they succeeded in the Third Reich, um, they, their assets, for the most part, were not expropriated in Allied-occupied uh, Western Germany. Um, and their wealth continued on in Western Germany, and, and, and today these are, you know, the billionaire dynasties of, 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 of Germany, Europe, and, and to an extent the world. But they went to great lengths, did they not, to cover their tracks, not only to avoid prosecution if they could, but also to avoid public shame. They didn't even have to cover their tracks, really, because if you look at post-war Germany, this kind of vacuum of 1945 and 1950, the U.S. or the, the American authorities, the American occupation authorities, which were leading, the, U, the, the British were very weak and so were the French. You know, for them, the Nazis and, and Nazi Germany quickly becomes, you know, uh, ancient history. Um, they, you know, the Truman administration makes, makes a decision to rebuild, um, I mean, a decision that was already made under Roosevelt but executes the decision to rebuild Western Germany as a strong, viable, as a viable democracy and a strong economic state as a bulwark against um, Soviet-controlled Eastern Europe and uh, Eastern, Eastern Germany at that point and the Soviet Union. And, you know, they start handing over hundreds of thousands of suspected Nazi war criminals uh, and ardent Nazi sympathizers back to uh, West German authorities for these so-called denazification trials, which quickly devolve into show trials because there's no incentive on the on side of the West German authorities to, uh, you know, to convict, to indict and convict their fellow compatriots uh, uh, on crimes that they had themselves committed and uh, sympathies that they still held themselves. So I think two of the myths that I kind of wanted to dispel with this book, historically at least, was that a most of these families were already extremely wealthy prior to Hitler seizing power. And B, you know, denazification never happened in, in, in occupied Western Germany. Um, the, the Allied authorities had a chance between 1945 and 1950 to kind of at least have an overseer, you, know, uh, you know, function as an overseer for these denazification trials. Um, but instead, not only did they not do that, they also did not expropriate any of the stolen assets from, the, from, from German business and, and, uh, and, and industrialists. They left everything intact. Whereas, of course, in occupied uh, uh, Eastern Germany, the Soviet authorities wholesale expropriated all the industrialists and summarily shot, uh, um, you know, uh, most of the, um, you know, na Nazi war criminals that were still that, um, yeah, that were still left behind or either incorporated them into the Stasi. So the underlying reasons why, and we're talking about the World War II right. criminals yes. who built their fortunes this way, uh, are there underlying reasons such as secret sympathy for the Nazis or apathy or perhaps kickbacks to keep the secret, that sort of thing? No, it was a political expedient decision on the side of the American authorities. Initially, the first decision was made in early 1947, um, as the Cold War emerges, to, to keep German business and industry intact, not only keep it intact, rebuild it, but also have all the industrialists and financiers keep the assets that they have stolen. And if, you know, survivors or heirs of those that had been murdered wanted any kind of judicial recourse, um, uh, to get their companies or their, or their houses or whatever assets that have been stolen back, they would have to litigate and these uh, proceedings would be fought to nil by the industrialists uh, and businessmen I write about. And they were uh, often, uh, often challenged on jurisdictional grounds where they, you know, uh, a family owned a company in, uh, on the other side of the wall and then the, uh, on the other side of, of um, in the Soviet uh, occupied authorities. And then they said, well, uh, the case would be thrown out because that is no longer um, a part of Germany, for example. Um, 
And then the second decision you see in 1950, with the emergence of the Cold War, and then the Truman administration and next the War Defense Act, and kind of all production is blocked out in the U.S. for, for armaments production, um, which continues under Eisenhower, and they kind of look to West Germany, uh, to its industrial prowess, to produce, um, to kind of fill this, uh, um, yeah, uh, consumer good um, a vacuum. Um, and they said, and the then German uh, Chancellor Konrad Adenauer said, well, yeah, if you want us to be your ally, if you want us to be your ally in the Korean War against communism, you know, you're holding all these men, uh, are you holding our citizens in Landsberg prison, all the men that were uh, convicted um, um, in the Nuremberg trials, uh, and we, we don't want them, you know, some of them are sentenced to death, some of them have life sentences. And, um, you know, we, we don't want them in jail, particularly not by a foreign occupation force. So the trade-off that was being done, and then you see, is that, again, John J. McCloy, um, the American High Commissioner for Occupied Germany, starts commuting the sentences first of um, the industrialists, there were three industrialist trials at Nuremberg, the entire executive board of IG Farben, the, at that time the world's largest chemical and, and pharmaceuticals company, uh, Friedrich Flick and his managers, and Alfred Krupp and his managers. Their sentences were commuted over 1950 and 1951, uh, and they were released and were also allowed to keep all of their assets uh, that were frozen under um, the Allied authorities, and they were returned to them. But secondly, and, and more, you know, far more um, uh, damningly, damningly um, tens of SS officers were slaughtered, hundreds of thousands of Jews, uh, on the Eastern Front, their death sentences are turned into life sentences, and by the mid-1950s, their um, uh, life sentences are, 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 are commuted and, and they're, they're released uh, back into German society. Did you find in all your research any records of remorse expressed, if only to family or friends, uh, let alone perhaps at the few trials that, uh, that were held? Not at all, none. And I think that's what shocked me most. I think the two things that or su surprised me, shocked me most, one was their breadth of involvement, kind of the, particularly of those, of, of uh, you know, the ideologue, sure, but also the opportunists, because the ideologues sometimes make business decisions which were against their business interests, but in favor of the Nazi party. So they would merge a very profitable newspaper with a Nazi party publication that bled money. But the opportunists, they, would, they had no scruples, what, they had no moral scruples whatsoever to, to exploit as many uh, you know, men, women, and children, um, you know, literally, uh, work them to death, use them as uh, Ben Farange, uh, the, uh, um, f the, the former U.S. Um, uh, prosecutor at, at Nuremberg, who recently died at the age of 103, uh, coined less than slaves. Uh, um, um, and that, you know, there was no, there was no kind of remorse, not in the denazification trials, not in the Nuremberg trials on the side of the industries, who said, well, we were, you know, we had no choice. We, we were forced. It was all, they blamed it all on the, on the Nazi regime, which they, you know, very willingly from February 1933 uh, collaborated very, very closely, very unquestionably so. But I think also, on, and I think what shocked me most, because of course the, the, the start of the book, it has a, you know, it has a contemporary starting point. Is, is there billion, is there heirs today, which, um, when they do speak out publicly, and these families are, are of course extremely private and um, uh, do not like talking to the, to the media uh, in general, and particularly not to me, um, you know, they, 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 they defend their, their, their parents, and, 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 or they defend their fathers and grandfathers. Um, uh, also, kind of copying the line, echoing the line, saying, well, they were forced to do this, they had no choice. But as a matter of fact, they did have a choice. It reminds me of the cliche we heard for many years about German soldiers when captured, saying, "I was only driving an ambulance at the Russian front." Right. Yeah. I mean, that that is. Yeah. I. I do think that, that there there is a distinction to be made between those 
um, German um, men that were conscripted into um, uh, and yeah, that were conscripted into the army, um, and you know the industrialists that from the very starting point, um, you know, had a decision to make and said, well, I'm not going to leave the country, which they could have, they would have been expropriated, but they could have. There's a very famous example, Fritz Thyssen, who was one of Hitler's first backers uh, from 1925 onwards, uh, when he had no backing from business whatsoever. Fritz Thyssen, one of the heirs to the Th Thyssen steel empire, who in 1930, who was so an ardent, a Nazi sympathizer, a, a, a convinced ideologue, an industrialist, who in 1939 makes the decision in a symbolic uh, parliament vote in the Reichstag to vote against the German invasion of Poland. As a result, he flees to Paris, his entire steel, um, um, uh, steel empire is expropriated, um, and uh, he lands then in a concentration camp, he's arrested after the uh, German invasion of France, lands in a concentration camp uh, for, the, for the rest of the war, and after the war is then sentenced by the Allies to three years in prison for being one of Hitler's uh, most ardent supporters. So, if a man like Fritz Thyssen uh, decides to make a stand, then the other industrialists could have done it so as well. And I'm sure Fritz Thyssen was, um, he wrote this kind of self-serving, or he had this kind of self-serving memoir uh, written by an American journalist in Paris, which is titled, I Paid, Hit I Paid Hitler. You can still order it on, on Amazon. But he was very much aware what the consequences would have were from b b of him, you know, making a stand against the Nazi regime. And he was an ideologue. So, so these, uh, his, his, his peers, like Günter Quandt and Herbert Quandt, like Friedrich Flick, like Ferdinand Porsche, like August von Fink, also had a choice. They just didn't take it. They, they decided to stay and profit by all means necessary. And these guys all knew Hitler. I mean, they were colluding with Hitler. Is that right or wrong? Yeah, no, they, they were. They were. I mean, the, these men were on such a level that they had direct contact with, with Hitler, with uh, Hermann Göring, with, uh, with Joseph Goebbels. In the case of Günter Quandt, even uh, familiar, t familial ties to Joseph Goebbels because his, uh, um, his Günter Kwan's second marriage, um, which produces one son, ha Harald, um, is to a woman named Magda Ritschel, uh, who um, uh, was later known as, as cause, because of her Jewish stepfather, then changed her name to Magda Friedlander, then became Magda Quandt, but of course became globally known as Magda Goebbels, the um, yeah the uh, the wife of, of Nazi propaganda minister uh, Josef Goebbels and the uh, unofficial first lady of the Third Reich who ends up of course murdering uh, her six children with cyanide in the Führer bunker on uh, April 30th 1945 before committing suicide uh, with uh, with her husband in the Chancellery Garden so so yeah the ties to the regime were very 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 intimate yeah. It occurs to me that there's a parallel to what we're seeing today in Russia. And they were colluding with Hitler. Hitler was making some money and Goebbels was making some money and they were making a lot of money. And of course the oligarchs in Russia have to collude with Putin and as long as they play footsie with him, then they make their money and he makes his money. I mean, it's a system that has been perpetuated. Absolutely, I mean, I mean the parallel certainly there is that of the men I write about, they really lay the they really become kind of Germany's wealthiest industrialists during the Weimar Republic, uh, during the era of hyperinflation uh, and, and, and volatility, both economically and politically, which one could very easily compare to the 1990s under Yeltsin. And then of course, when Putin comes to power in, in, in January 2000, you know, and he summons uh, all the, the, the Russian oligarchs, Hitler did three weeks after he uh, seized power in Germany, did exactly the same thing. Um, and they have this, you know, they make this devil's pact, um, uh, which the, the, the Russian oligarchs made uh, more than two decades ago, and from which they profited uh, greatly, and to an extent still do, because the sanctions by and large are not very, not very effective not to the scale, not relative to the scale of wealth that they have accumulated so far. 
Um, so in that sense, they've already profited twice as, ma twice as many, uh, you know, double the many years that the, that the German uh, industrialists did. Of course, um, you know, the, the, we don't, you know, the, the kind of the scale of, of, of human exploitation that uh, I'm always very wary of comparisons, but the scale of, of human exploitation that the that um, Germany per perpetrated on, under the Nazi regime, you know, is is not yet. Uh, who knows what will happen in the next few years? Not yet comparable to what is what, what Russia is doing today. Today, back to the billion, the, the Nazi billionaire mm -hmm. families. Uh, we're talking about second, third, even maybe fourth generation yeah. uh, Germans who are riding, as I said in the introduction, high on the bounty. Yeah. Uh, you know, running these corporations and or running the fortunes that they produced. Uh, talk a little, please, or a lot, about contacting, perhaps confronting, some of these modern day heirs. Yeah, so it, it, at the end of the book, there's a notes on sources and it details all my efforts to uh, reach uh, the heirs or their spokespeople, uh, their spokesmen and women, uh, and with my interview requests and, and uh, my uh, uh, you know, list of questions, and also the uh, responses of those institutions that have uh, taken their money in the name of their Nazi war criminal fathers and grandfathers. And, you know, with the exception of one heir, a, 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 the eldest grandson of Friedrich Flick, who is 80 and lives in London, uh, Mook Flick, uh, Gertrude Flick, um, all the others, uh, either, uh, he's, he co I corresponded with him on, on record, um, and he said, you know, many bad things have come out about my grandfather, but he was a genius who gave us so much more than wealth alone. So he clearly couldn't distance himself from his grandfather. But all the other um, heirs, um, you know, the, the BMW heirs, the Porsche heirs, the Utker heirs, um, uh, they, yeah, they all de declined, uh, they all declined my interview requests. Their spokespeople tried to dodge my questions as best as they could if they wanted to answer them or, or, or declined to comment at all. So, uh, yeah, that, those were my, you know, years-long efforts to, to what, get them. What questions would those have been? Well, the questions is why, you know, um, you maintain the Friedrich Flick Foundation um, in the name of a convicted Nazi war criminal, but there is no reference uh, on, uh, on the foundation's website uh, of his, uh, of his uh, convictions at Nuremberg. Why is you know why is that what well, you know things like uh, things like that if if they decline my interview request then I send over kind of the questions that I want to ask them or do you feel um, you've never spoken out about uh, the Nazi history about your father or, or grandfather and, and their profiteering um, now is your chance is there anything you would like to say on the record um, you know you've never paid into uh, the general compensation fund. Uh, of, of Germany, uh, why did you? Why haven't you done that? Are you planning on doing so, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And you got zeros. Um, you know, Porsche, um, not zeros. Um, the spokesman for the BMW heirs uh, said, "We don't think a renaming uh, of, uh, of, of of foundations and corporate headquarters and streets is a good way of." of dealing with history, um, to which I respond, yes, but you don't show anything about what Herbert Quant did during, I mean, you, today you have the BMW Foundation Herbert Quant uh, motto, inspire responsible leadership in the name of a man who built a sub-concentration camp who exploited thousands of forced and slave laborers, including female concentration camp captives in Berlin battery factories who acquired companies stolen from Jews. And the only reference, if you go to the BMW Foundation Herbert Quant is, um, uh, is the fact that he saved BMW uh, from a bankruptcy in the 1960s. Um, and, um, you know, Porsche, um, uh, for example, the Porsche spokesman, when I approached them, they were in, in, in the run-up to their IPO of Porsche, um, which was, a, you know, a massive, uh, uh, you know, a 
project for them. I mean, they IPO'd at a 70 billion euro value, about an 80 bi billion USD value um, a Porsche in September 2022. And after the book came out, institutional investors in the US and the UK started asking questions, um, um, you know, saying, well, if you lie about your history, are you also going to lie about your financials? So in their IPO prospectus, in their S1, they have a clause saying, revelations from 1933-45 may, may come out and uh, may uh, you know, affect our share price. Um, and as a result, they actually ended up settling with the heirs of the Adolf Rosenberger uh, family. It was um, uh, kind of historical, uh, more of a uh, historical settlement to rewrite um, Adolf Rosenberger back into uh, the Porsche family history because um, they wanted to clean house and uh, and um, you know there will now be a study about Adolf Rosenberger um, and he will be rewritten into a Porsche company history so that's one of three main developments that have come out of the book since the book has been published so far let me ask you a philosophical question and everybody here might come up with a slightly different answer or, or a vastly different answer but you've given more thought to this than probably darn near anybody. For how long should the children pay the price for the sins of their fathers and grandfathers? Well, they shouldn't pay the price. They should just be, oh, oh, they should just, um, uh, the, the reason why I wrote the book is, is because German business as a whole never had to take kind of any kind of moral responsibility for the crimes of the Third Reich. This is literally the case because in 1999, when the Clinton administration and the German federal government uh, came to a settlement to restitute surviving forced and slave laborers, um, in which German business ponied up five billion and the German federal government ponied up another five billion to compensate uh, surviving um, forced and slave laborers. Um, they, there was a clause say, in that settlement which said that German business does not need to uh, does not have to acknowledge any kind of wrongdoing, culpability or guilt with regards to the crimes of the Third Reich. So they, they, they paid money, but they never had to take any kind of responsibility for history, which allowed them in the decades following uh, 2000, up until today, to never really take any kind of moral responsibility uh, for the crimes. And in, what they do instead is, um, uh, you know, engage in this, in, 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 yeah, in this, in his whitewashing, his brazen re revisionism of history. And that is exactly, particularly when it comes to families with so much economic, political, and, and, also, you know, and financial power uh, in a day and age of such misinformation. To, uh, to, uh, you know, what I'm arguing for is not much, it's to at least acknowledge these crimes and be transparent. I'm arguing in favor of radical transparency. I do think that it ends with this generation. So with you know, the fourth generation, like, um, I'm, I'm talking about the heirs who were born between 45 and, and, and 1980, who, to, who are today the controlling shareholders, or, um, you know, their children, you know, it, that's why, you know, I think it needs to happen, this kind of moral reckoning, this historical reckoning needs to happen now, because, um, you know, the next generation doesn't have anything to do with it anymore. I mean, it's too, too far removed. Do you have any reason to believe that the next gener generation or the youngest generation alive today actually doesn't know, doesn't know the roots of the fortune? They know. I mean, again, it's not the roots of the fortune, right? I mean, they were already very wealthy prior to 1933. But they, they, are, very, they are very well aware how, uh, I, I think, I'm for, um, particularly since my book has been published and is said to be published in more than 20 languages, you know, that they are, um, you know, that, that there is a massive taint to, uh, to the fortune that they are inheriting. But of course, that is the case for German business as a whole. I just focus on, focus on those that are most uh, powerful and where the wealth uh, is more, most concentrated. And with that, the responsibility or the moral and the historical responsibility is, is, uh, is most concentrated. But, you know, and it is not even, we can even take it far, for, further than Germany, of course, but just focus on Germany for a second. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I do think they're aware of, of it. And, and hopefully it will propel them to do better, you know, or to be more mindful of history. 
this is not a rhetorical question. Has this kind of thing, the kinds of things you've written about, the kinds of things you uncovered, not been written about before? I was shocked. I mean, I started reporting on this subject in 2012, 2013, and I, for, I think it took me, it took me first of all three and a half years to write the book, book proposal. But in those years, I was always worried about, you know, somebody else coming out with a similar book like this, or, 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 something. and I was astounded that no one in Germany uh, had done a book like this, but. One, when I moved to Germany in 2017 for the research and writing of the book, you know, it is extremely hard for a German journalist to do this, not only because German the press law is very restrictive, far more, I mean, you know, if, if you compare that to the US, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's extremely restrictive, more on the end of the British, uh, who are also have extremely str stringent libel laws. But, you know, Germany as a whole, it's, at its core, it's a very, still a very conservative, old-fashioned, and, you know, and in parts also, uh, you know, quite a provincial country, and where, where, where authority is not easily questioned. It's very hierarchical still. So, for a German journalist to, to write this book, you know, one of these questions, one of these families would, could, could turn around and say, but, but, you know, who are you, you know, uh, first of all, who are you to question us or like to, to write about us? And second of all, what did your father and grandfather do uh, uh, during, uh, during the Third Reich? And, and again, who are you to question us? So it is, it had to take an outsider, um, you know, a Dutchman to, to, um, to uh, yeah, to, to write this book. You know, there's a very stark contrast to the Jewish community in America and Europe and around the world, yeah. which is struggling to keep the history and the memory, a very good reason of the Holocaust alive. But the people who engaged in the atrocities of the Third Reich are going in an entirely different direction. They want to quell the memory. Yeah. And well, they want to swept it under the rug. Yeah, and yeah. Hope it stays swept under the rug. But yeah, I do want to nuance that because I do think that Germany, for its rightfully fabled uh, memorial culture, you know, as you see in many countries around the world, you know, the most powerful actors in a, con in a, in, 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 in a country or in a society do not want to think that the rules of society don't apply to them. And that is, the, I mean, these families are the exception to the rule in Germany, what, which has an incredibly strong and mindful memorial culture when it comes uh, uh, to the Shoah. And, and it is, it, it, you know, it is important to point that out because since my book has been published in Germany, in, in the, the German translation of the, uh, of the book came out two weeks after the original English language one, you know, there's been, uh, it's, it's, it's done very well and there's three separate editions of the book in Germany. One is a, the regular edition and there's kind of a limited edition and then there thirdly, in, no, in, in this October, November, the German federal government is publishing an edition, um, mm -hmm. a five euro or a five buck edition, <coughs> to uh, widely distribute to a non, to an audience which doesn't u usually, to non-reading audience, or that doesn't usually read, or that doesn't have the money to pay uh, um, 30 euros or 30 bucks for a book. So um, it, it's very much resonating in, in, in Germany as well, the book. Can I tell you a story? Please do. Because I'm telling you a story too. Uh, I'm Jewish, raised by Jewish parents in San Francisco. I was born right at the end of World War II, and as long back as I can remember, my father always said I wouldn't even buy a piece of German chocolate, let alone a German car. His very best friend was a guy named Goodwin, Goodwin Key. And Goodwin, at a certain point in the 1960s, became fairly prosperous. He became wealthy enough to buy a Cadillac but he didn't buy a Cadillac, he bought a Mercedes. My father confronted him. They had a shouting match, and for almost 30 years until my father died, they never spoke again. Oh, wow. Would you blame Goodwin Key for buying, buying that Mercedes? No, I do not. I mean, I think that consumers, you know, I think people should, with the fact, with the, with, with the you know, with what I lay out with my book, they should, 
you know, decide their, their own consumer decisions and what they, what they want to spend their money on. You know, I think what people should be mindful of is that the money you spend on these products can turn into the dividends for these families and can, can go towards maintaining global charitable foundations, media prizes, museums, academic chairs, uh, corporate headquarters in the name of Nazi war criminals. That is a certain uh, mindfulness that consumers should have, not only with German products, but uh, you know, perhaps. But then you know, you're overwhelmed as a consumer as it is. So you know, you can't, you can't. I mean, you can't expect from people to always be, you know, considerate with, uh, with everything. But it is important to be to be aware where your money flows, as it were. Until you wrote this book, and not everyone on earth is going to have read the book, how would people be aware then? It's not enough to say it's made in Germany, so maybe it was built on the backs of slaves. I mean, it is, it is you know, to every, there's always a kind of a divide, uh, particularly uh, when speaking to uh, Jewish audiences or, or majority Jewish audiences, where, you know, half says, you know, we do not buy uh, German product, pro products as a, or, or used to, or historically don't buy Jewish products. Uh, Pardon, German products, as a um, you know, as a, a, a as a rule, and others say, well, you know, I'm not going to let my, uh, myself by those kind of, you know, historical reasons. And and how one should be aware, I mean, you know, how one should be aware is how one should be aware of everything by 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 being informed about what goes on in the world. And you know, that is also something we see, unfortunately, uh, less and less of these days. Also, given the you know, how misinformation is, is, is rife globally through social media and, you know, cable news and, and all other, uh, uh, you know, many other uh, ways that we consume media. And, uh, you know, that is, that is something that is unfortunately, uh, being informed is something that is, that is on the decline. You're familiar, I, I guess almost everybody's familiar with the uh, film Schindler's List. Yeah. And that to refresh everybody's memory in case it needs it, uh, Schindler was an industrialist, he joined the Nazi party, he built a plant, I think it was an enamelware plant in Krakow, Poland, yeah. which is where I've been several times because it's a very close city to Auschwitz. And for a while he ran his business on the backs of slave laborers, but at a certain point he turned heroic and ultimately, and this is the theme of the movie, he saved the lives of reportedly about 1,100 Jews. Did you, in your research, when originally you must have been casting a wide net, did you hear about, read about, any other stories along those lines? You have the story of Robert Bosch, which, you know, founded one of, what is today, one of, which was already back then, one of the world's largest uh, electro-engineering companies, Bosch. He was a very liberal man, particularly for a German industrialist, who was a pacifist, and ardently anti-Nazi, and he um, was, you know, he funded, he died in 1942, um, but he funded through his right-hand man the, uh, the German resistance or whatever there was of, of, of German resistance. Um, and, but even he, you know, profited from being a, through boss, from, from being an uh, arms producer and also um, exploited uh, forced labor. So, you know, as with everything, there was, there is, no, there is no, you know, he's the most positive example I can find of, of among, you know, the, the, the German big business of, of, of that era. But it's a short answer. And, and there is, well, actually, there's another example, which is an important one, which was, which was a man called um, um, Bertolt Betz, who was Alfred Krupp's, a right hand, who became Alfred Krupp's right hand man after the war. And he was actually tasked with kind of rehabilitating Alfred Krupp and did so extremely successful because Alfred Krupp was, was uh, Kennedy, um, you know, hosted him at the White House in, in, in 1962. Um, and Bertolt Beitz actually saved as an executive at, at, at Continental uh, Oil, not Continental, the um, the car, com the car uh, company, um, he saved also, I would say, anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 Jews in German-occupied Poland. 
um, and he, he, he lived to become 101, or 103 even. And um, yeah, so that is another uh, example. But then, you know, he did, um, he became kind of the eminence grise of, of, of German uh, post-war uh, industry and business. Um, but he also had no qualms of, of as Alfred Krupp's uh, right-hand man, a Nuremberg convicted Nazi war criminal, of re re rehabilitating uh, uh, his boss on the world stage and, and again, doing it so very successfully. So it is always, you know, it's not black and white, it's, it's, it's gray skills. It's not simplistic. No. All right, anybody out there have questions? Congratulations on a great book, great work. I look forward to reading it. Did you cross-reference or come across American and Swiss and other companies that have similar collaboration and similar benefits, uh, as you describe in your book here, to the German companies? On the American front, there's, the, well, there's a few famous examples. Um, there is General Motors, which through its subsidiary, Opel, um, you know, continued to operate its Opel, Opel subsidiary in Germany uh, during the Third Reich and also its subsidiary also exploited forced and slave labor um, including concentration camp captives and um, um, produced, uh, um, also produced armaments. Um, that is one example. There is of course the, exa the example of, 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 of Ford was a very virulent anti virulent anti-Semite, um, but uh, did not do business uh, in, in in Germany as far as research has, has shown so far, because Ford wasn't didn't have any big plans in, in Germany. It was in, in Detroit or subsidiaries. Thirdly, there's the example of IBM, which is very controversial because Conrad Black's book. IBM and the Holocaust was actually banned by um, very renowned uh, Holocaust historians, including Omer Bartov uh, at, at Brown. Uh, he doesn't deliver a kind of, um, you know, uh, closing evidence of, of uh, IBM's, in, in, you know, sealed in, in involvement in, in, in the Holocaust. Um, so that's on the American front. And more famously, Ige Farben, operated a lot of subsidiaries in the United States during the Third Reich. Um, IG Farben, again, the largest pharmaceuticals and, and chemicals company at the time, which was the only company that the Allied um, uh, authorities broke up uh, after um, uh, or during the Allied occupation of West Germany into what is today Bayer, one of the largest pharm pharmaceutical companies today, and BASF, one of the largest chemical companies. Uh, today. Um, as for Switzerland, I mean, Switzerland is, a, 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 you know, as, as somebody who's, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, Switzerland is a, last week the, the U.S. Um, the U.S. Senate, now I'm thinking about which committee, um, they issued a report on Credit Suisse uh, maintaining of, uh, uh, accounts by uh, SS officers up until 2002. And the news broke last week, I think Bloomberg broke it, or, uh, yeah, Bloomberg broke it, uh, that they haven't, that Credit Suisse hasn't uh, give, uh, provided all of the information uh, with regard of the active accounts to, to today. I mean, that is just a sliver of the involvement of, of, of Swiss banks, um, which, has been settled to an extent, but it, there's still so much more recent, so many more things to uncover on the Swiss front um, with regards to UBS uh, and Credit Suisse and other smaller private banks. You have the famous example of Bürle, if anybody's been to Zurich and the new Kunsthaus uh, there, there's a massive uh, arms um, uh, armaments manufacturer, uh, Bürle, who uh, also profited off the Third Reich with arms, and there's a whole you know, con there's a whole transparency context about what uh, Bürle did during the Third Reich. Uh, we got to visit the, 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 his um, permanent exhibition at the Kunsthaus in February, and it's very well researched, but it was a huge controversy surrounding having the Bürle permanent, it has an, he has a stunning collection, but of course it was partly uh, financed his collection by, by his profiteering during the Third Reich. 
uh, of arms production. So these are a few examples. Next one's to your right. Yeah. Yes, full disclosure, as my father's a German Holocaust survivor, and my grandfather's uh, business was Aryanized. When Germany was creating its compensation funds that had been really distributed through the claims conference, sorry, through the claims conference, were these companies, large companies, uh, required to put into that funding? Because where did Germany come up with all of it when it was so broken? So it's important to separate the Jewish Claims Conference, which started in the 1950s and, and did their work, I mean, they're still doing their work, uh, and the settlement of 1999 between um, the Clinton administration and the German federal government, which was on the American side, negotiated by Stuart Eisenstadt. Um, so at the time when the Jewish Claims Conference started its work in the 1950s, you know, they have, they got, it was, Krupp was actually, it was actually, as part of his rehab, rehab, rehabilitating his, his image, actually paid into the Jewish Claims Conference. But there's a famous, uh, there's, there's a part of my book where I detail Friedrich Flick's, you know, cruelty in dragging out uh, uh, negotiations with the Jewish Claims Conference. Uh, about uh, he, he owned uh, Dynamo, Dynamite Nobel uh, after um, he acquired it uh, uh, alongside Daimler Benz after his release, uh, um, after his sentence, the Nuremberg sentence was commuted. Um, and uh, he, he, he dragged out the negotiations with the Jewish Claims Conference and at the end said, I'm not going to pay anyway because I didn't own that company during the war. Um, so, you know. Th the Jewish Claims Conference got enormous, uh, following the reunification of, of Germany, of course, got way more traction, but you know, they have to be commended with how early they started their work and they laid the groundwork for so many uh, you know, restitution and compensation claims that, that, that came after. I mean, they were, in that sense, they were really pioneers and they did commendable work. Staying on your right. Uh, thank you. I had two questions that nice lady asked one of them, but I'd like to clarify something. The first question, a short one, has Hollywood approached you to do a story on this book? And the second question is, uh, billions of dollars to the credit of Germany have been provided to many survivors. Other than the five million dollars that you mentioned earlier, that they matched the government, during these 75 years, have any of these billions of dollars of reparations come from these countries, companies, or was it all just from the government? So let me start with your second question. So in, in addition to the 10 billion that was paid in 1999, mind you, of the 5 billion that German business paid, 60% of that figure was, was paid by only 18 companies. More than uh, 6,500 German companies only paid in the symbolic amount of 500 euros or about 600 USD into that composition fund. So it were 18 companies, BMW, Allianz, um, Daimler, Continental, Deutsche Bank, etc. like really the big, big names of German business globally, which paid 60% of that 5 billion. Now, in the meantime and since, or before that and since, of course, so many kind of bilateral uh, restitution and compensation claims have been settled already from, say, 1945 onwards, right? Between companies and sur survivors or, or heirs of those that were murdered, you know, were claiming restitution and often these cases took decades, years, decades, there's still so many restitution cases ongoing, particularly with regards to art and real estate. But there are, in addition to that, there have also been many compensation claims, many of which are still going between countries. So, you know, the Dutch railway, there's a claim against the Dutch railway uh, or against the German railway, which has been ongoing. For, for decades. 
So um, the companies only paid if, if they were directly sued by, say, a, a, a survivor or a, and it, in that case ended up going to court or the case was settled, which didn't happen. You know, we're talking about very few cases. Um, so that is quite, you know, most of it, I, w I would say, is, is government money. Very few is, is actual company money. Uh, as far as Hollywood goes, Hollywood has not approached me, but other production companies have, and talks are ongoing. If you'll bear with me, I just want to take a small tangent. I've heard many times that the Vatican is a holder of lots of artifacts and lots of gold, lots of money, et cetera, that they exploited the Jews. Do you know anything about that? I do not, but I do recommend two extremely good authors and reads that I've recently come across. One is David Kurtzer, who, has, who is the, was a professor of anthropology at uh, Brown University. It, it, it's for, for Brown's former provost who is probably the most, the foremost in the English language world um, authority on uh, the Vatican archives. And he has published two books, one book which won a Pulitzer Prize in 2015. It's called um, um, Pope, uh, it's, it's a bond between the rise of fascism between Mussolini and Pius XII or something. I, I don't know my popes that well, I have to apologize. <laughs> but a book that he has just published is called The Pope at War, which goes in between the relationship between the Pope that succeeded the Pope that died in 1939. Um, and he spent 10 years researching this book in the Vatican archives. And it's a between the, the Pope and his relationship to Mussolini during World War II and to Hitler. And uh, I'm, I, I just received the book and I'm very excited to dig into it. Secondly, of course, there is, some of you may know this book by Philip Sands called The Red Line, um, which is, is even more well-known book is, uh, is, is East West Street. Um, but uh, one of the characters in East West Street, a, a Nazi uh, officer called Otto Wächter, um, he follows that as he goes to Rome to kind of get, and he die, he ends up dying in Rome. It's already, I, I don't give anything away because that's where the book starts with. Um, but uh, the red line was those that were, uh, you know, transported out of, 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 of Italy with the help, were aided by the Vatican. Now, as far as the looting of, of Jewish assets uh, that ended up in the Vatican, I do not know anything about that. But who knows, a Philip Sands or a David Kurtzer uh, could um, very well, uh, that could very well be one of their ne next projects because these are really two brilliant men. David, you make me wonder of all the people you looked into in connection with the Nazi mm -hmm. billionaires, did any of them go the way that some of the uniformed leaders of the Nazi party went, meaning down to South America, the Mengele's, the, the Eichmann's? No, that's also something, these people didn't have to leave. They were in that way, they were too big to fail. You know, they, the Allies needed them for Germany's rebuilding. So they were, you know, um, you know, whether you were deemed a fellow traveler in a, um, uh, even if you had been like, you know, one of the biggest industrialist profiteers of the Third Reich, but you were deemed a fellow traveler during uh, denazification trials, or you were Friedrich Flick, who was sentenced to war crimes and crimes against humanity, but whose sentence was commuted and who the uh, Allied authorities uh, had him keep all his assets in, in West Germany, you know, they didn't have to go anywhere. So they didn't have to flee to, 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 to South America. It was only, uh, first of all, they didn't regard themselves as, as criminal. They, you know, they saw themselves as just usual uh, businessmen doing business as, as usual. Um, and, and yeah, they didn't have to flee. So they could just stay and, and, and continue on profiting without uh, any kind of consequences. <clears throat> Our next question's on your left. The Vail audience can ask questions on both sides. Uh, <laughs> and if folks up top have a question, I'm happy to run up there with a mic. So just put your hand up and I'll run up there. Here's our next question. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal journey from the Netherlands, Columbia, New York, and now in Tel Aviv? Absolutely. I was born and raised in Amsterdam. 
Um, and then I came to New York for graduate school. And I ended up not in journalism. And I ended up as a reporter at Bloomberg News, where I spent six years. And then I moved to uh, Berlin for the research and writing of this book. Um, and then uh, my fiance got a job as the um, television correspondent for German public broadcast um, for c covering Israel and the Palestinian territories. Um, and we moved to Tel Aviv two years ago. And I got a job as a Middle East correspondent for a Dutch financial, financial newspaper. Um, so that is, in short, my bio. One this more. is not as naive a question as it will sound. I made a living asking questions right. like this. Uh, why Berlin in particular? It was actually a condition of my publisher. Um, I had to move to Germany for the, or it was a condition of the, in the contract actually of, of the American publisher I sent. You know, if they, they, I had to move to Germany because I was like f thinking about, oh, maybe I'll just do it from Amsterdam, you know, be nice to be back in my, my hometown. Uh, and then they were like, no, you have to either move to Frankfurt or Munich, or we really want you to immerse yourself because it's such a massive task and, you know, we're giving you a nice advance. So we wanted to, you know, to put you, for you to put it to use, you know. And then I decided, you know, between Munich, Frankfurt and, and Hamburg, uh, you know, Berlin was certainly the nicest uh, city to, to base myself from a good base, you know, you know, very good archive, you know. You know, a lot of the archives were based there as well. But I heard the nightlife is pretty good too, so. But were there a lot of written historical records? There actually were. So the, the Quant Archive is uh, in Darmstadt, south of Fra Frankfurt, which is, so they all com commission these studies, but then they don't give their entire archive to, that this is an important thing that I haven't mentioned yet. So what they do when a scandal breaks in Germany, of, you know, beloved Patriarch X or beloved Company Z, uh, it's Nazi company, uh, Nazi past or atrocities coming, coming to the fore. What they, they pacify it by saying, oh, we're commissioning an independent historian, we're going to open our archives, and then, you know, you don't hear about it for or five years, and then a study is published, which is 1,200, at the minimum, 1,200 pages in dense academic German. Um, which never reads, reaches a wide audience in Germany itself. It is only discussed kind of in, in, in German academic uh, circles. So the German public as a whole does not know the details. But more importantly, none of these studies ever get translated into, uh, into other languages. So survivors or, or their heirs do not have kind of the big picture of what happened to them in, in, in the factories or mines that they were exploited or in the uh, sub-concentration camps that they were exploited to work in for these companies or, or, or these families. But the families then can say, oh, but we had it all figured out. Here's the, you know, here's the study in the, um, you know, um, uh, so they hide the history in plain sight, which also allows them to then continue on their kind of their public facing, their consumer facing entities, whether it's their corporate websites or brochures or their foundations or media prize or whatever <coughs> to pretend that they didn't do any of that, that you know, none of this uh, uh, has ever um, happened. Um, so these studies were very helpful, but then of course these studies, you know, often the archives or at least the material that, for example, the quant study uses it's in, in Darmstadt in the um, Hessen uh, business archive, the Flick archive, is in northeast Berlin. It's like one of the most remote places in Berlin. And it's literally on an industry terrain. You have to go to the back entrance, three floors up. And then, you know, it is, it, so the, these archives, you know, you have to make an appointment to go to the archive. Uh, some of the archives, you know, uh, continue to be closed. Um, so those archives were, you know, were my main resource, but also, of course, NARA in, in, in Washington DC and College Park, Maryland, where a lot of the Allied um, documents were uh, accumulated. A lot of it is now accessible online as well. You know, there were a lot of memoirs, a lot of through antiquariats, you know, German antiquaries are extremely, extremely well um, uh, sourced. And I could get all kinds of memoirs that, are, that are, have not really been, you know, um, have circulated that much. I could buy for, you know, uh, not, not very expensively. So there were all kinds of sources 
uh, that I could access uh, in the four years uh, that I used Berlin as a kind of um, uh, yeah, a base to, to do my archival research trips from. Yes, um, you had mentioned that when you approached the heirs and spokespeople from the various companies that were involved, they refused to grant you any interviews. I was wondering if since the book has been published and reached and received acclaim in Germany, um, whether any of the heirs or companies or spokespeople have uh, said anything about, about the situation. So there's been three developments from the book. One I've mentioned is the settlement between the Porsche Pierre heirs and the heirs of Adolf Rosenberger who live in Claremont, California, which is, mind you, is, is not a financial, um, uh, financial um, settlement. Adolf Rosenberger owned 10% of Porsche. Um, uh, you know, it would have been worth billions today if his heirs, but uh, Adolf Rosenberger lawyers settled behind his back in 1950. Uh, uh, for the pittance of 50,000 Deutschmark and a choice between a Volkswagen Beetle and a Porsche uh, <laughs> sports car. Uh, and, and um, you know, Adolf Rosenberger was lucky enough to immigrate to the United States and, and settle in, in, in Los Angeles. But um, uh, the other two developments are that the BMW f Foundation, Herbert Quant, um, uh, one, of his fellow, one of its fellows is a man named Anton Goodman, is a British-Israeli guy who had received money uh, from, from, from this foundation to bring Israelis and Palestinians closer together. He lives in Sur Hadassah, south of, of, of Jerusalem, and he works for Rabbis for Human Rights and previous to that for the Abram Initiatives. And he was furious to find out as a Jewish man to have been lied, to have received money in the name of a Nazi war criminal and to have been lied to by BMW. And he rallied this global network of BMW fellows and they're in this now whole reconciliation and reckoning process. But the BMW board is stuck between its arch conservative uh, controlling shareholder, Stefan Quant, the son of Herbert Quant, um, who um, is one of Germany's richest men and who, you know, refuses to kind of, well, he doesn't really want to um, uh, want to make any changes. And between these fellows who, who are furious to have been lied to, and they've actually appointed an external lawyer now to advise on a name change of the BMW Foundation. It's a lawyer, um, a Jewish lawyer in, in Munich. And there's going to be an update, there's going to be some kind of resolution on that by the end of the year. Um, very curious how that's going to turn out. And thirdly, um, the um, Tel Aviv Museum of Art is reviewing a donation by uh, one of the members of the Flick dynasty, which has donated about a million dollars to the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. Um, the Flick dynasty, or that branch of the billionaire branch of the Flick dynasty, has never paid into any kind of compensation fund, have never, has never spoken out about their Jewish, or about their. Um, uh, you know, their profiteering, their third Reich profiteering. And um, this all came to the fore um, because of, uh, there was recently a, a auction at Christie's of a jewelry uh, collection, the Heidi Horton collection. And Heidi's Horton husband, uh, Heidi Horton was one of Austria's wealthiest women, she was an heiress, and her husband Helmut Horton had laid the base of his foundation in Germany by Aryanizing Jewish department stores. Her jewelry collection went to uh, auction, uh, she, had di she died last year, went to auction. It was the biggest jewelry auction that, that Christie's had ever done in early May this year. It was a big outrage about it because Christie's didn't really say who, you know, where, the, where the money came from. Um, and as a result of that, the Tel Aviv Museum of Art cancelled a restitution conference that Christie's was supposed to ha hold at the... Um, uh, at, at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art at the end of uh, at the end of the year, and then I was and then a former colleague of mine at Bloomberg co called me up and said, "But hey, don't you mention in your book that these family that these German business families have also given money to the Tel Aviv Museum of Art?" So she writes about that in her column, and then, you know, um, yeah, as a result, now the Tel Aviv Museum of Art is reviewing that, that donation. As far as public statements by the family goes, nothing. I know that Stefan Quant and kind of the BMW heirs, they've said to a journalist that they find it very unfair 
what I wrote uh, that was relayed to me by a German journalist or um, yeah, uh, unjustified, I think is were, were, was his exact words. Mind you, this comes from a man with an estimated fortune of 40 billion, who's also the largest donor to the Christian Democratic Party in Germany, uh, the Conservative Party, uh, Angela Merkel's uh, party, and who sits on the board of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, one of Germany's largest newspapers, where every year that he awards the Herbert Kwan Media Prize, the media prize in the name of his uh, Nazi war criminal father, he gets to publish his column, also very conservative, in, 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 the, um, in, the, in the newspaper. So, you know, you, you get to see how little reflection kind of on reality uh, some of these people so uh, have. Is there any place outside the world of scholars like you, of Holocaust sl scholars, where Frick and Quant and others are dirty words? Yeah, I mean, do, do they have to be dirty words? I mean, they don't have to be dirty words uh, or dirty names. They can just, you know, speak out, and they don't. They don't take kind of. They don't take responsibility for history. They don't take moral responsibility. So far, I mean, they still have the chance to do that. You know, um, uh, that is, you know, uh, and the reason why they do it, I can only hypothesize about this, is because a, you know. Their entire identity is built up of what they inherited. They stand there in the shadows of their fathers and grandfathers. To disavow them publicly, I think, also means a huge identity crisis for them, because what then remains of their own identity, which is completely built around them being heirs. Um, and they're kind of managing this, this, this fortune. Secondly, um, you know, they have huge business interests. You know, them speaking out publicly could very much hurt their shares uh, standing uh, of, of global brands whose myths they protect, particularly with regards to Porsche and BMW, you know, uh, vigorously. You know, these, these brands have to be, and their business interests have to be protected at all costs. So their handlers also do not want them to speak out. Uh, and, you know, they being very private, you know, also don't see so far any reason to. I think, I think there's time. I think we can maybe get two more quick ones two in. More. And then David will be here in the side chapel uh, to sign books and answer your questions. But I think we can sneak two more in. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for, for this talk. Very interesting. And I look forward to reading the book. I just got it from Bookworm. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I would be remiss not to add. It's an essay. Um, daughter of a Dutch Holocaust survivor. I'm really curious about your own background in, in terms of your Dutch background and your interest in um, perhaps unraveling or writing about some of the Dutch Holocaust history, which is very dark, and, um, and the collaborations yeah. and so forth. Uh, very few things have been written in English uh, on this topic, and so, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to speak about my own family history. I first do want to point out that a very good book has just recently been published by Nina Seagal, who is a uh, New York Times reporter based in Amsterdam, who wrote a book, she's from New York originally, who wrote a book called The Diary Keepers, which follows uh, the stories of seven, uh, of two Nazi members in Germany, three Jews, mm -hmm. and two kind of neutral, um, um, you know, kind of uh, observers of what is happening in, in occupied Netherlands during, during World War II. I can very much recommend uh, uh, anyone if they want to know more about the Netherlands, which relative to population deported uh, the most amount of, the most number of Jews behind Poland and Hungary, including my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother, um, Salomon de Jong and Friedrich Steintal. Salomon died in Bergen-Belsen and uh, Frederike uh, uh, survived. Um, but with regards to my grandparents, my grandfather or hid in Amsterdam. My paternal side, uh, which um, is, is Jewish, um, my uh, grandfather uh, hid in Amsterdam for three and a half years during the war and survived. My grandmother and her three-year-old daughter, my aunt Jacqueline, who today is 40, 84 year old, years old, um, my grandmother was a Swiss citizen, and she fled uh, together with her daughter uh, and her companion Max van Damme, a painter, um, and uh, to Switzerland in 1941. And they um, were 
at the Swiss, French Swiss border were um, arrested by, by Gestapo officer, officers, and one Gestapo officer took pity on my grandmother and her three year old or two year old daughter and said, um, you know, uh, report back tomorrow morning, implicitly flee tonight, which they did, and they ended up. Um, um, fleeing over the mountains to Zurich, where they set out the remainder of the war. Max van Dam um, did report back and ended up being murdered in, in, in Sobibor. Um, from my mother's side, um, my uh, grandfather, um, John de Zwart, um, tried to flee together with his best friend to England. To, they were, he was a very avid sailor and tried to flee, uh, sail to England with his best friend. And on their, second, um, uh, on their second attempt, they were uh, caught by, uh, they, they, their sailboat blew back to shore and they were caught by German soldiers in 1941. And he was sentenced to 20 months as a political prisoner in, in, uh, in, in, in the German Ruhr area, in the industrial area. And he was, you know, had to work, um, had to do forced labor in a, uh, in a steel factory. And he was six foot five and he, um, came out weighing 100 pounds and he survived in a sanatorium in, in, um, in the Netherlands and then had to go back to a sanatorium in Switzerland. But, you know, lucky enough, my, my grandparents all, uh, all survived and, you know, my parents were all born after the war. Um, but yeah, that is, that is my family history. Yeah. The last one is in the back on your right. I, I was wondering if you could speak more about the commutations of sentences after yeah. the war and if there were any political ramifications for the people who carried them out or for the families or if um, there was any reasoning given. Um, you know, the man who was in charge of these, of, of these commutations was, as I mentioned before, the US High Commissioner for Occupied Germany. He was a man named John J. McCloy, who was the Under Secretary of War under Henry Stimson um, during World War II. He was also responsible, I think, for the Japanese, he also devised the Japanese internment, or the Japanese internment, uh, internment camp of, of American citizens of Japanese descent in the United States. So this was a man who, you know, he was a very prominent lawyer, banker in the US and politician, who basically had the, you know, as, as um, high commissioner, but uh, his word was, you know, it, it, he didn't have to report back on, well, he had to report back why he made these decisions. And I went through his, to his archive at, at Amherst College in Massachusetts. And a lot of it is actually still, um, is actually still, um, how do you call it, um, it's still secret, um, uh, particularly under State Department uh, uh, rulings. But there is no good reason why he made those decisions between 1950 and 1955. He said that, oh, the sentences were too harsh at Nuremberg and he had to take in kind of the political context. So you, he, you, he hints uh, in, in, in the few writings that are accessible of, of his kind of political expediency. And, um, but of course, Telford Taylor, who was the man in charge of the uh, Nuremberg um, successor trials, was you know, furious. And um, um, when you know uh, John J. McCloy, um, you know, did those commutations not only of industrials but again also of these SS officers who had been sentenced uh, to death. But again, it was political expediency. They needed West Germany as a staunch ally in the in in, in the Cold War, in the Korean War, um, as an you know ec economic powerhouse, uh, you know. Uh, Germany got to rearm already in 1955. It got to join NATO in 1955. And, you know, um, that was that. There were no ramifications except for historical <laughs> damnation in, in, in certain circles, but that's it. David, I'm going to end this with a question you could probably take longer to answer than any other. Okay. And I'm going to okay. ask you to do it in 30 seconds. All right. Okay. So it's a headline. Yes. What's the single most important takeaway from what you learned what you wrote. That historical and um, moral tra transparency is, 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 particularly in this day and age, is key, is, is trumps all in a way. One has to learn from history by showing the good and not only, by showing the good and the bad, not, not the good. 
Um, sorry, that's not a headline. That's those are, and it's more than 30 seconds. But yeah, that's. You've come a long way since you were a bicycle courier in Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah. David, Dion. ladies and gentlemen, Greg Dobbs Thank and you. David Dion.